Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, nice to visit with you. Mike, Mike was talking about uh, older folks and uh, what's going to happen to us as we all as we all age a bit. And uh, it's true, I'm going to worry about your children instead of uh, worrying about what's happening to us. Uh, I'm, in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, how it is our kids learn to read. And I'm going to talk about how what we've learned about the brain mechanisms that underlie uh, learning this skill. I, I think that uh, learning to read might be the hardest thing that we ask our kids to do and that when they're growing up. It's a really challenging task. It involves vision, controlling your attention, controlling uh, the interactions with language and so forth. And I'm particularly interested in that problem of uh, both how ch uh, healthy control kids learn how to read. And, and then there are quite a number of ca cases in which folks uh, who are otherwise really healthy and they're smart and they're capable and they're motivated just can't pick up uh, the skill of reading. And that, uh, why that would be is, is important. And particularly in the modern age, figuring that out sooner, we can help those kids uh, compensate for the lack of ability to read uh, with tools and technologies and so forth. If we catch it early enough, it can be quite helpful. So what I'm going to do as I present today is going to be really two parts. First, I'm going to tell you about uh, the, the parts of the reading circuitry that I can understand. It's a, it's a really big set of circuits that involve language and all kinds of parts, hearings, uh, uh, language, attention, so forth. But I'm a vision scientist, and I understand the visual parts of reading best of all. And I'll tell you about uh, what we've learned about those parts first. Uh, and then second, um, I'll tell you when we check kids for why it is they can or can't learn, uh, there's a lot, as I said, there's a lot of parts, and we need the ability, data management tools, to be able to think about checking all the different parts and understanding how the rise and fall of one part or another part uh, could matter. It's, it's not one part at a time, it's how the whole system works together. And for that reason, uh, we really need a lot of data management tools and data at scale to help us understand uh, why this particular kid is having a, a hard time learning to read or, or succeeding. So those will be the two parts that I cover for you. So the first thing, if you might start this video for me, um, maybe, maybe I can start it, there you go. Uh, the first thing, about 20 years ago, as we started looking at visual cortex using a form of magnetic resonance imaging called functional magnetic resonance imaging, you, we could see uh, the structure of, we could see the responses in the, in the living human brain in some detail. And uh, what's shown here is you're seeing the right hemisphere of a um, person's brain. It's been the, the cortex has been smoothed and expanded a little bit so that you can see in and out of the sulci and gyri and so forth. And the person's looking at the red dot, and as that stimulus expands, you can see a pattern of activity shifting smoothly uh, from the very, very back of the brain onto, um, from the very, very back of the brain forward. Uh, for those of you, this part over here is actually called the calcarine cortex, and that's where primary visual cortex is. This entire region here at the back of the brain is covered with uh, not just one uh, map like that. This is just showing the fovea to periphery representation from the center to the periphery over here. Not just uh, one map of eccentricity, but in fact, if you, um, if, if you have people look at a rotating wedge instead of an expanding ring, you can see that there's another pattern of uh, activation from representing the lower visual field to the upper visual field over here, so that each of these little patches in the, in the cortex of a single person uh, represents really the whole visual field. And we call those maps. And starting, we could start to see those in the living human brain in single, in single people, uh, and starting with the work that we did in 1994, and, and I've spent about 10, 15 years worrying about those maps and how many of them are there and so forth. And so uh, at this point, we have a sense of nearly all of the maps that tile the very back of your brains right now. So that's, that, that's how they're responding. Now, to understand reading, we know that part of reading pertains to seeing a word and then tracking its signal through these maps into specialized parts of cortex, uh, such as uh, language cortex and attention and so forth. So these particular pictures here are showing uh, some of the visual field maps. The first one is shown here, V1, V2, Visual 2, Visual 3, and so forth. Here are these additional maps. 
And this particular picture features this little red part over here called the visual word form area, VWFA. And that particular piece of cortex is special from the point of view of reading. Uh, V1, V2, V3, we use generically, whatever we're looking at. Stuff goes through V1, V2, V3. But when, you're, when a kid is learning to read, uh, something special happens here. The size of the signals increase quite significantly during the time when they're learning to read. And if they can't read, uh, or fail to learn to read, in fact, these signals there don't rise. And we don't know exactly whether it's that part that blocks it, but we, can, but we do know that that part is plainly associated with the ability to learn to read or not. Uh, in fact, you can track in individual subjects when some, if you fixate on, if uh, somebody looks at a little spot like this and a word is presented just to the right, you can actually track uh, where the word goes, uh, where the activity from the word starts in primary visual cortex, secondary, uh, through these things down here to the visual word form area with the sequence of uh, spots that's shown uh, on the visual cortex of a single subject. So we, we have a set of parts there that we can check for the, for the parts of uh, what, what it is we can see in a single kid at a single time in terms of their ability to, uh, in terms of their ability to read. As I've been emphasizing, these signals, once they're processed visually, go off into all kinds of other parts of the brain. And to get into those, uh, and we need to check those parts too. You know, it's like if your car mechanic shows up, if you show up at your car mechanic and your car doesn't work, there's a lot of stuff that needs to get checked. It's not a, not a simple matter. And carrying, out, uh, carrying those signals to other parts of the brain happens on the white matter pathways. And for the last 15 years or so, uh, we've also been able to study many of the different white matter uh, pathways in the human brain. These are the long-range axons that connect uh, one, cell bodies in one part of cortex to another. Uh, they're quite active. They, they change during development. Um, they're not just passive wires that sit there and you, know, get, you get born with them and that's the end of the story, but they change quite a bit in response to experience and learning and so forth. And uh, again, using a different type of magnetic resonance imaging, we've been able to identify those pathways in the living human brain and measure the tissue properties on those pathways. And a lot of what we worry about is how well we, uh, these pathways develop in their size, position, tissue properties, and so forth. So that's, uh, I'm now showing a series of these. The first one is the um, optic radiation in green is was what carries the signals into primary visual cortex. There are a few others I'll just show you just to give you a sense of the complexity of these pathways and how we can identify them in uh, a single child in the, living, in the living human brain. So now we have a lot more parts to check. In fact, just as I told you that the VWFA has to work right or else that kid won't learn to read, uh, one of these pathways, uh, well, several of them, but this one I'm showing you here in particular, has, a, has to have a kind of developmental trajectory uh, that indicates a good reader versus poor reader. And uh, the, the red over here show what happened to the poor readers in a study that we ran some, a few years ago. The poor readers, the same measure of um, integrity that Mike was referring to before, fractional and isotropy goes down in poor readers and goes up in um, good readers on this particular pathway. Okay, now, how much information is there uh, if you look at these, these kinds of diffusion measures of, of these structural pathways? Well, it's actually this good. You can take uh, the, a couple of these pathways here. This is the arcuate and this ILF that I was showing before, and you can actually predict uh, a child's reading score. 100 is average, 120 is quite good, 80 is not so good. And then you can go measure their reading score. And this prediction is based on the, uh, is based on the pathway itself. And you can see you get this, this is about how well you do. You can explain 43% of the variance, uh, and, and it, it looks okay. It's good enough to publish. But actually, if you're actually looking, if you're actually looking at a um, kid, right, shows up in your clinic, and you'd like to know about that particular kid, you can see it's not that great, because if you look at any particular slot here, uh, say around 100, in fact, uh, this is the predicted reading score, but the actual reading score is, is quite distributed around that. So we really need to do a lot better. And to do a lot better, uh, we need to count on a lot of technology from, this is a summary, uh, to, to, to about how well we can do. But to do better than, than that, we, we really need to uh, in, improve our tools in a couple of ways. 
And Mike was emphasizing the ability to go deeper, so understanding these pathways, better measurements on them is, is really important to us. But also to be able to compare the kids who come to us with a larger population of kids. And that's really important because, you know, you sit in your lab and you want to write a grant and say, oh, great, I'm going to go get, get 100 kids and study this. They're going to have some particular language. They're going to be some part of the country. It's going to be too, it's going to be too limited, too narrow for a particular lab. So one of the things that I've been extremely um, focused on in the last couple of years has been taking this basic model of here comes my one subject, my one kid, and comparing the data from that individual against a much broader range of people, and maybe people who are like that one. So these are people who learn to read, uh, and I can have their brain data, and they can match, and they can match the kid that's shown up uh, in our particular clinic. And we refer to that as, you know, the term personalized medicine is, of course, very well known, and this is a form of personalized neuro neuroscience. And what would that work? How would that work for an example? Well, suppose you've got a. So we, we've done this in ophthalmology at this point in a, in a number of studies, but I'm quite interested in doing it for reading. And uh, so you have a subject or a patient with, in this case, a retinal eye disease or reading disability comes to the lab, and you know you can find their optic radiation, and you want to do a checkup on that. So you go and you say, well, okay, here's the fractional anisotropy uh, of that particular of that particular person. And it's important to use validated tools, reproducible software for the track tracing and for the measurement and so forth. And you can compare that person with a distribution of controls. And because I'm fortunate enough to be uh, running a center, we've installed software, we've built, that I'll tell you about in a second, and installed software for managing the data sets so that I can actually tell you for the entire control population of people who are well sighted uh, what the distribution of fractional anisotropy is as you measure from one organ, it's called the lateral geniculate, into primary visual cortex here, that's what it looks like. And so for one of our subjects who had a particular eye disease, a retinal disease called Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy, you can see they're off the chart over there. But others who come in uh, with the same disease uh, actually are within spec on that particular pathway, and the thing that's wrong with them is, some, is something else. And the same thing is going to be true for kids. Uh, who have reading disabilities. Some of them are going to be uh, off the chart in one particular pathway, but well within spec in other pathways. And we don't know what all the different patterns of success and failure uh, are going to be for uh, those groups of kids. And we need the tools to go and do that. So I know a lot of the folks come here and are talking to you about the large st studies that they've done, but I've come here to talk to you about why I need large studies and what we've done to just get started in accumulating data of the sort so that we can diagnose the, uh, so that we can diagnose the individuals. And I'll just end with a few notes that the, the key thing that we've been doing at our center and that we hope to have partners on is we've been doing a technology development um, project to acquire every single scan <clears throat> and database, every single scan, and now there are many thousands from our center in a way that reduces uh, barriers to sharing, and, and we don't take the data and deposit it at the end of the process, but we get the data at the first moment that it's measured, and, and we keep it there, and it stays your data. Uh, you know, you control it, you have user rights management, but uh, we get it right at the beginning, and we validate it, we check it. Mike was very worried about whether the data are accurate and whether they're, uh, what the signal to noise is and so forth. Well, we let you know that on the very first moment. And uh, these this tools, are very valuable for helping people share between labs and expanding. And so this particular uh, project, which we call the Project on Scientific Transparency, is our way of accumulating data on kids, uh, comparing individual kids to the broad distribution. And uh, I'll be happy to talk about this as... Uh, I can see my time is up. I'll be happy to talk about this as, uh, as we move into discussion. Thanks for your attention.